Hi, I'm Steve Palumbi, and this is Lecture 5 of the Science of the Extreme Life of the Sea. Today we're going to talk about the changes in diversity of life in the oceans, animal life in the oceans. Uh, the last couple of lectures I talked about microbial life, the billions of years on the planet where um, there was only single-celled life. Starting in the Edicarian period and then the Cambrian, uh, we saw the evolution of multicellular animals and plants. What it's graphing is the number of families in the ocean over time. The family is a taxonomic unit. Um, for example, kingdom is the largest unit in the animals. Uh, below that, there are many different phyla. Uh, echinoderms, for example, are a phylum of uh, animals in the kingdom Animalia. No, that phylum is made up of a number of different classes, including sea urchins, which is a class, sea stars, and sea cucumbers. Below that is the level of orders, and below that is families. Now, what this shows is that since the Cambrian, the number of families rocketed up over time until the, the <clears throat> period of time right after the Cambrian called the Ordovician, um, at which point there was a dramatic decline. Those dramatic declines are mass extinctions. There have been five of them over the history of animal life, and we'll chart through those. But we'll also talk about organisms that made it through some or even all of those mass extinctions um, and what the fossil record tells us about diversity over time. Well, the first group we're going to talk about that made it through a number of those mass extinctions are, are an amazing group of organisms uh, for which we have actually very few living examples. Um, they're the ammonoids and the nautiloids, uh, groups of organisms that um, you take a look at here. What do they look like? They look like squid and cuttlefish. And they're related to squid and cuttlefish. They're cephalopods, just like squid and cuttlefish are. But instead of being soft-bodied, um, ammonoids um, have a hard shell that covers the entire body, and so do nautiloids. The shells are enormously different in shapes and sizes. This is just some of the, the kinds. Um, the typical ones are coiling all the way through, but some have an open coil, some have a U-shaped coil, some have a double coil like that, some are coiled like, like snails. All of these animals lived early on um, in the Cambrian and in uh, subsequent epochs. Uh, they're related to the rest of the mollusks in the, in the following way. Uh, this is a phylogenetic tree, the evolutionary history of mollusks. On this side are a small set of mollusks, some of which don't have shells at all. Um, the most abundant common one right now are the chitons that have eight shells on this side of the branch of the uh, mo <clears throat> molluscan tree. Over way over here, there's the gastropods, a small group called the scaphopods, bivalves like oysters and clams. Um, a small group of monoplacophorans that just have a single shell, and then the set of cephalopods. In our modern seas, that's dominated by the coleoids, that's the cuttlefish, and the squid, and the nautiloids and the ammonoids come off of this branch um, along, along here. Now, these animals were fairly large in early seas. Uh, they had tentacles, big eyes, just like um, squid and octopus do now. And this diorama here shows one other really surprising aspect um, to, to these, and that's that they are swimming predators. Uh, so the question is, how do they manage to be the first really abundant and successful swimming predators when not only are they um, covered in a very huge shell, but the animals themselves can be pretty big? Well, if we look at the one surviving member of this entire group, the nautilus, we can see how it manages to not only have a heavy big shell, but also be a floating swimming predator. So this is a cross section through a nautilus. Uh, the animal is living in this bottom section right over here, but you can see on the uh, outside of that, in the coil on the way in, a whole series of chambers that are formed in the shell. And that's why this is called a chambered Nautilus. Well, those chambers are actually full of gas that allows this entire shell to become neutrally buoyant or even positively buoyant. Well, how does the animal control that? Each of these chambers is punctured by a small hole, 
And there's a tissue layer called a siphuncal that runs through that entire set. And that siphuncal is the organ that um, produces the gas that fills the chamber or absorbs it. So more gas means more buoyancy, less gas means the animal is sinking. We can take a look at how these animals swim over uh, just small distances. Uh, they're kind of cumbersome. Um, this is an animal that I photographed in the Waikiki Aquarium being, being fed. This is a chambered nautilus. Uh, you can see it's fully neutrally buoyant. Um, it's also able to maneuver around. Well, uh, if we look back at the history of these organisms in the, in the ocean, uh, it can be diagrammed out, out this way. Uh, these uh, figures show the diversity of each of different lineages within the nautiloids and the ammonoids. And the width of these black lines charts the diversity of the animals within each of these different types of taxa within these different these different groups. So starting down in the Cambrian, you can see there's an explosion of diversity uh, that moved through time. Nautilus, the nautiloids came in first, but then these lineages start dying out because these lines basically drop out of the picture. The only of the nautiloid lines that survived uh, for a very long period of time is the nautilita themselves uh, that come up here to, to the future, I mean, come up here to the present with that one genus Nautilus. The ammonoids got a little bit of a later start. They diversified enormously. They're a very dynamic group. Some, some groups got very large, then went extinct. Other groups uh, didn't diversify till later on. Then they got very large. They all went extinct um, eventually. Well, uh, the extinction of these animals actually played a huge role in the oceans because they were the first of the large swimming predators, which meant that they had access to eating a large number of other than the larger animals that were taking over the early seas in the planet. Um, about the same time that their diversity was going up and coming down, other large swimming predators evolved, like the early fish and the early sharks. We, saw, we will see diversification of those groups only after the nautiloids begin to decline in, in abundance and the ammonoids become less less common. The ammonoids completely died out at the end of the Cretaceous period uh, in that mass extinction. And as I have said, the only nautilus left is the one genus that we have now in deep tropical seas. The second group we're going to talk about that has survived many of the mass extinctions, but not all, um, are the trilobites. They appeared early in the Cambrian, um, they're part of the diversification of life that occurred in that period that really gave rise to the theory of the empty barrel uh, that we talked about a, a couple of lectures uh, ago. They survived two mass extinctions, but then they died out in the Permian mass extinction. Uh, they are particularly notable um, for having enormous diversity in early seas. Uh, they are a kind of arthropod. They have all of the features that uh, we, we ascribe to arthropods, uh, they have an external um, shell, uh, they have many segments with limbs on them, and in this case the trilobites have, have a uh, head area um, with eyes and its mouth, a more flexible trunk uh, with its many, many segments. Uh, they were sometimes very small, the biggest ones were dinner plate or bigger size, and uh, they came in a wide variety of different colors and shapes um, and, uh, and embellishments. So uh, this trilobite, for example, is pretty armored without a whole lot of extensions. But then you have trilobites that have very long uh, posterior protuberances. You've got some where the, the, the uh, legs themselves have, um, have uh, chitinous outgrowths. Uh, that proceed for a long time. My, my favorite is actually uh, Willicerops. Um, pretty normal looking tri um, <clears throat> trilobite on this side, but all of them have this trident that sticks out of the, the front end um, and is probably used for digging around in sediment um, in, the, in the early seas. So these trilobites came in a wide variety of sizes and shapes. Uh, and they had adaptations to living in early seas, which 
are absolutely fascinating and, and some of which have died out with them. Of that, this is my, this is my favorite example. Uh, the eyes of trilobites are compound eyes, uh, like many arthropods. Um, instead of any living arthropod right now, trilobites used lenses in their compound eyes that are made of calcium carbonate. Now, calcium carbonate, now we think of as shell, like the shell of a clam is calcium carbonate. But there's one form of calcium carbonate that is crystallized so that it's transparent. And trilobites have that form of calcium carbonate, tr transparent calcium carbonate, uh, that allows them to build these intricate compound eyes. Well, they came and went over time. Uh, they diversified very quickly in the Cambrian and built up. Uh, then they declined over time uh, in the Ordovician, built up again, crashed in the Ordovician uh, mass extinction, built up again, crashed again, built up again, and then finally went extinct at the end of the Permian. Well, what we've been talking about are dynamics of a couple of different lineages over time. Um, the trilobites, the ammonoids, and the nautiloids, uh, and their ebb and flow, their crashes and rises um, in the context of these mass extinctions. But what I want to do now is just go through these mass extinctions, talk a little bit about the dominant life in each one of them and the severity of those, of those mass extinctions over time. Uh, there are five of them. Um, one at the end of the Ordovician, one at the end of the Devonian period, um, the big one at the end of the Permian, then at the end of the Triassic, and more famously the end of the Cretaceous when, when the dinosaurs died. Uh, the first one about 440 million years ago, the end of the, Devon, uh, the Ordovician period, uh, this particular drawing shows an ammonoid eating a trilobite as an example of the kind of e ecological predator-prey relationships that were probably pretty common at that point of, uh, of time in the early seas. Well, the mass extinction there uh, led to the demise of 26% of all the marine families in the oceans on the planet. That's about 60% of the genera and upwards of 80, 88% of all the species of animals on the planet died during that mass extinction. Most of the nautiloids went extinct. Uh, a lot of the trilobites died out as well. Uh, the late Devonian was another 80 million years later. And at that point, um, the seas were dominated by very different kinds of organisms. Uh, the first of the armored fish were very diverse and a very big, important swimming predators at the time. That's shown here. Uh, this particular one is chasing uh, an early shark because the sharks had evolved by then. About 420 million years is when we see the first sharks, but they hadn't actually become ecologically dominant or very big. Um, instead, the early fish predators in those oceans were uh, these armored fish. But the mass extinction of the late Devonian uh, wiped out that ecosystem. Um, 22% of all the families, 57% of all the genera, and another 80 to 89% of all of the species died out in the late Devonian uh, mass extinction. Reef systems, that not modern coral reefs, but um, accumulations of marine invertebrates on the bottom that built living reefs uh, died out completely, the early form of those. Uh, those primitive armored fish completely disappeared. Uh, and that led to an ecological vacuum that some people think that sharks took over and began to diversify as a result um, of that. We're not sure what caused either the, <clears throat> the, the last two mass extinctions, um, although later mass extinctions, we have a better idea. Uh, the third mass extinction was at the end of the Permian, about 250 million years ago. Uh, this represents a very large crustacean-related um, arthropod uh, that was a dominant part of those seas but went completely extinct during the Permian. And it's called the big one because about 50% of all marine families died in that mass extinction, 82% of genera, and up upwards of 95-97% of all marine species died in the Permian mass extinctions. The trilobites vanished, coral reefs disappeared. Um, and it's thought that this one was caused by an increasingly a quickly warming planet. Um, 
with huge volcanic eruptions, uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, greenhouse warming, and then ocean anoxia uh, that kept the um, those conditions from being very uh, conducive to animal life for, for a very long time. In fact, some of the best research on the Permian extinction is actually how organisms recovered from the Permian extinction. And it happened, but it took millions of years to happen. Uh, volcanism was high during that period of time, still with the CO2 in the environment. Um, that acid, the CO2 causes uh, seawater to become more acidic. That caused weathering, which caused microbial blooms, which caused the dead zones by eating up the oxygen in the ocean. And those conditions all together made it more difficult for animal life to return to its normal diversity and, and abundance after the Permian extinction. So one of the lessons in all these extinctions is that Life recovers, but it takes quite a while for it to recover the diversity that was lost in a quick extinction. The end of the Triassic period saw um, about 20% of families and about 80% of marine species uh, wiped out, including, including almost all the ammonoids. Um, some species that are some groups that had really built up huge diversity, like the bivalve mollusks, lost over 90% of their species. Um, here, part of the reason why people think perhaps this in Triassic uh, mass extinction happened was not a cataclysm or a volca volcanism, but a huge change in how the continents were associated with one another. About 220 million years ago, the continents of North America and Europe and Asia were all joined together in one landmass but they were on different tectonic plates and they started moving apart. So by about 200 million years ago, there was a rift here between what is now the continent of North America and then Europe and Asia. And this rift is what is the essentially the Atlantic Ocean opening. That rift changed ocean patterns and thinking goes that that caused such a difference in uh, environments that mass extinctions took place at that time. At the end of the Cretaceous is when uh, dinosaurs were a dominant part of the uh, ecosystems on land. And uh, that event wiped them out. Here, uh, we know a little bit more about the causes of that mass extinction. A large uh, asteroid crater in the in around the Yucatan Peninsula um, is probably the site of a in, impact of a large asteroid. That, uh, essentially changed the weather of the planet. It changed um, how plants could uh, photosynthesize and produce food. Uh, and it caused devastating extinctions, not only in the ocean, but, but on land. 60% um, of families, half the genera, 80% um, of the species, but especially on land, um, all the large individual animal species um, almost completely died out. The ammonoids finally went extinct. The dinosaurs uh, <clears throat> went extinct as large reptilian dominant species on the inland. Um, and uh, at that point, we begin to see a shift towards what is now uh, our modern set of fauna, uh, the, the mammals on land, fish in the oceans, uh, and even the beginning of the return of mammals to oceans with the evolution of uh, the pinnipeds and the, and the cetaceans. Well. Um, in this whole period of change, uh, we see the coming and going of dominant ecosystem players like the trilobites and the ammonoids. Um, they gradually come up. They sometimes survive mass extinctions, and then they eventually go extinct. Uh, but another class of organisms through this whole period of time are, are critters called living fossils. They have survived many of these mass extinctions with hardly any change. And that's going to be what our next lecture is about, living fossils, and then how different ecosystems over time have managed to survive uh, mass extinctions that lead to our modern ecosystems today.